Question for you this morning as we begin. Have you ever met someone that you really looked up to or admired, but then later on you were disappointed in them because you sort of found out that they weren't who you thought they were? That, that anybody, right? That the character or the integrity that, that you thought you saw in them or some characteristics that you thought they displayed or they seemed to display weren't really who they were. Right? We've, all, we've all encountered that. And this morning we're, we're going to be in Ephesians chapter 4. And in, in chapter 4 of Ephesians, and we're moving into the second half of Paul's letter to the church. And we looked at, at the second prayer that he prayed for them yesterday. And then as we, as we move forward from that prayer, Paul really begins in this section of, of his letter to really begin to, to lay out a challenge to live out all of the things that he's been talking about, right? The glorious riches and the wonder of the gospel and, and, and what Christ has done for us and all that he's put in us and who we are in him and our identity and our calling. And so now he's going to challenge the church at Ephesus and ultimately through the power of the Holy Spirit to challenge the church of all time to live out who they are in Christ, to, to really be the real deal. And so I, I ask that question because I want us to think about it of ourselves. Are we really living out who we are in Christ? Are we being the real deal, if you will? Are we being authentic in our faith? And Paul's going to challenge the church to that. Our, our word for today is worthy. Worthy. And so as we look at Ephesians chapter 4, we're going we're to look at the first six verses and they're, they're pretty dense. In the sense that in these six verses, there's a ton of stuff for us to look at. So we'll try to get to as much as we can. But I want us to frame our thoughts around looking at these verses by looking worthy. We're blank up here. Not sure why. All right. We'll just know that the last side said worthy in really big letters, all right? Most of you can spell that if you're writing it down. If not, just ask the person next to you and they'll help you out. But we want to, to think about and frame our thoughts about what it means to, to be worthy. And so I want us to have that word in mind as we look at, at the text. So let's read together and uh, begin with verse 1. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore I, a prisoner of the Lord, for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been Called. So Paul begins this second section uh, of the book by, he says, therefore I, and he, he reminds them that he is a prisoner for the Lord. Now, Paul wanted to remind them of, of his condition, not to, to draw attention or to get sympathy, but to remind them that they could trust God no matter what circumstances they faced. I, I think it's interesting that Paul says he's a prisoner for the Lord. You know, he, he is in prison unjustly. But he doesn't blame the Jewish people who wanted him there. He doesn't blame the Romans who were keeping him there. Right? He doesn't look at his situation and say, they did this and they did that and this shouldn't have happened and I shouldn't be here and I, this isn't fair. Right? But a lot of times we do that in life. But instead Paul says, I am a prisoner for the Lord. He knew that his days and his destiny we're held in the hands of God. As we begin this second section, as we think about walking worthy, it's important for you and for me to remember that. And listen, we all, we all have a tendency, self-included, to lose sight of that. Right? We all have a tendency sometimes to forget that our days and our destiny are held in the hand of our Savior who loves us and who gave himself for us. And Paul knew that. And so he says, no matter what you're going through, no matter what you're facing, no matter what the circumstances of your life might look like or be, I want to urge you, he says, to walk worthy. That word urge, it's a word that means to call along one side, to summon, to beg, to entreat, or to beseech. All right, not a word we use every day. But if you want to use that word today, Try it out, all right? Try it out on your roommate. I beseech thee, right? Now they'll look at you funny. So this word, it, it's, a, it's a very passionate word, right? It's a very intense word. So he says, I urge you, right? I'm urging you. This is, there's passion 
here. He says, I'm urging you to do something. I'm urging you to walk worthy. That word walk means to make one's way, to progress, and to listen, to make due use of opportunities. So what's he saying? He's saying, I'm urging you to make due use of your life. Listen, your life is a gift that God has given you. Right? He made you, He created you, He fashioned you, and He saved you. He redeemed you to Himself. And your life belongs to your Creator. Your life belongs to your Savior. And it is a precious gift. And God wants you to see this life that you have as something that you have, that has been given to you by God, that belongs to God, but that you would use for His glory. Right, he said in Ephesians 2.10 that you're his masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus, what? Four good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And Paul, one of the churches, says, walk worthy, make good use of your time, right? You only have one life to live. And listen, you, you will realize quickly in life that life goes by way faster than you'll ever imagine, right? The Bible says that our lives are like a vapor, like a mist that, that appears for a little while and then disappears. And so Paul says, in, in the brief time that you have on this earth, make due use of your life. So he says, walk worthy. That, that word has an idea of weight. Right? When he, he uses that word worthy, he says, a weight. What is he talking about? He's saying, a life equal to your calling in Christ. He says, you should live a life that, that is as weighty as the calling to which you have received in Christ. That God's called you to a relationship with Himself. He's called you to know Him. He's called you to experience living relationship with Himself. And He says, I want you to live a life that is equal to, that's worthy of the calling that you've experienced. That you have been saved and that now you have been called to live for Him. So He says, walk worthy of this calling. Walk worthy of the gospel. So there's this passionate, attention-getting verse here in verse 1 where he calls us out and urges us. Don't miss this. And, and I think this came out of his own experience, right? Because Paul had tasted how good God's salvation was. He knew the joy of being redeemed from a life of not knowing Christ and actually persecuting Christ. And now he knows him and he loves him. And he says, my, my passion is to know Christ. And he says, I want you to walk worthy. So we might step back then and say, that's great, but how? Right? It's one thing to be challenged to do something. It's one thing to be told to do something. But there's few things more frustrating in life than being asked to do something that you don't know how to do. How many of you say that's a frustrating feeling? All right. I don't like to be asked to do something I don't know how to do. So Paul's going to lay out for us how to do that. And he's really going to do that throughout the second half of this book. So we're not going to touch all of it this morning. But I want us to just consider these next couple of verses. Because Paul there is going to begin to show us how we live a life that is worthy of our calling. So look at verses 2 and 3 in Ephesians chapter 4. He says that we're to walk worthy with all humility and gentleness with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now as we think about this, you have to understand a little bit of the context of the world that Paul was writing. Humility was despised in the world that Paul wrote to. Right? Humility was not seen as a good characteristic trait. It was seen as a slave-like quality. It was seen as weakness. They, their culture admired self-made men, right? Humility was not something that was popular. And we might, you know, find very much similarities in our own culture today, couldn't we? Right? That humility is not something that culture says is a good value to have. But Paul is calling his followers to, and the followers of Christ to live different. And we're going to talk more about that tomorrow. But here he's saying, you need to have genuine humility. What is humility? We talked a little bit about this at sing time last night. And uh, I appreciate what Mr. Raleigh shared with us. Because it was perfectly lined up with our message today. That humility, and this word here that, that Paul uses for humility, is, is all about seeing yourself as who you truly are. It's having a deep sense of one's own moral littleness. One's own moral littleness. What does that mean? That means that we understand that apart from Christ, we have no righteousness, right? Our, our, our attempts at righteousness, as we shared last night, are like filthy rags. 
So he says, have humility. Remember what you are apart from Christ, but then remember what he's done for you. You're now his masterpiece created in Christ Jesus. So he says, have humility. Have humility. Living a worthy life. Right? Living a life equal to your calling means that having genuine humility that comes from realizing that God has been gracious to me, that I was a sinner, that I deserved His judgment, that I deserved His wrath, that I deserved to be separated from Him. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. And when we remember that, when we remember that God's been gracious, that He hasn't treated me the way I deserve, but He's been actually treated me exactly the opposite of what I deserve. And when I realize I've become a recipient of His grace, it ought to produce genuine humility in my life. A a genuine humbleness before Him to say, God has done this for me. Right, and then he says that humility should be worked out through some characteristics. He says gentleness. All right, this is the concept of meekness. It's power under control. Right, and no one exemplified that better for us than Jesus, who was the all powerful creator and yet who was very meek. In fact, Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11, he says, I am gentle and lowly of heart. Right, this this is the kind of characteristic that takes away our rough edges. How many of you would admit that you have a rough edge or two? Anybody? All right. We all, listen, we all have some rough edges in life. And God wants to help us grow in those areas. And he wants gentleness, meekness to be something that's a characteristic of our life. Then he says patience. And, and in this, this case, it's using the word of not seeking revenge. How many of you have ever wanted to pay somebody back? How many of you have actually followed through? All right. How many of you say it felt good in the moment? How many of you regretted it later? All right. Payback always feels good in the moment, right? It's our natural instinct to pay back. But Paul here says, if we're going to walk worthy of our calling, if we're going to be people of genuine humility, if we're going to be people who are meek, then we also need to be people who are long-tempered. Long-tempered. That we have a long fuse. Why? Because we remember that God has been what? Gracious to me. And if God's been gracious to me, if God has not treated me the way that I deserve, I don't have to treat people the way they deserve to be treated either. In fact, I can treat them how God's treated me, with grace and with kindness and with mercy. And then he says that we should bear with one another in love. We talked about yesterday about being rooted in God's love, his unconditional love for us. And God wants that unconditional love that he's given to us to be something that then comes out of our life and that is expressed towards others, right? First towards the family of God and then to neighbor and then to enemy. And so I I think about how this works in our life and I I think about all of these things, this, this humility and gentleness and patience and love. And I think about Peter, right? Right, Peter, the, 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 the disciple who was very brash, very bold, Right? And, and Jesus appointed him to be the leader of the twelve. But, but Peter had a lot of rough edges. Right? He had foot and mouth disease. Right? Anybody have that? Right? Where he's constantly sticking his foot in his mouth. Right? He was saying things without thinking. Right? He, in fact, one time Jesus actually had to tell him, get behind me, Satan. Right? How many of you say, it's pretty serious when Jesus calls you Satan. All right? Right? Peter had a lot of rough edges. He denied Jesus three times with, ur- with cursings and oaths and swearing. Right? Peter had a lot of rough edges. But Peter was somebody whose life was transformed by Jesus. And it was empowered by the Spirit. And I want you to think about this rough fisherman who sometimes spoke before he thought, who had a lot of rough edges. But listen to what he says later in his life. Check out these verses. He says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22, he says, Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere, what? Love for each other. Love one another then deeply from the heart. Right? Peter experienced this trans- trans- transformation that was incredible. In 1 Peter 3, 8, he says, Finally, all of you, what? Be like-minded. Be sympathetic. Love one another. Be compassionate. Be humble. Right? Peter's life had come to a point where he was radically transformed by Jesus and by the gospel. And so we, in the same way, are to experience that transformation if we're going to walk worthy. Then he says, be eager. How many of you have ever been eager before? 
All right. I notice it's sing time. Uh, when it's time to pick a song, some of you get what? Very eager, right? Pick me, pick me. But in the same way, he says we should be eager to what? Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So he says if we're going to walk worthy, if we're going to be people who live lives equal to our calling, that we need to live in unity, he says, of the Spirit in the bond of peace. So he, says, he says there should be a sense of unity among those who know Christ. That there ought to be a, a really powerful connection between our lives. And he's going to share some reasons why and what that looks like. In 1 John chapter 3, verse 16, John said, We know what real love is, because Christ gave up his life for us. And so we also ought to give up our lives for our Christian brothers and sisters. And so this, this life of unity is, is based on the fact that God, through Jesus, gave his life for us. He gave up his life for us. And he says, we now as his followers are to reflect that and to live lives of love and, and unity with one another. And unity was a, and is a very foundational concept in scripture, right? It's, it's the characteristic of God, right? In Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 4, what? The Lord our God is one. Right, God exists in three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. They live in a perfect unity with each other. And God wants that unity to be lived out in our lives, in, in relationship with Him. Right? First, we have to be unified with God. Romans chapter 5, verse 10 says this, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by, death, by the death of His Son, how much more then, now that we are reconciled, shall we, live, shall we be saved by His life? Right? So he says, we were reconciled to God, we were separated, we were enemies, but now we've been brought into relationship, we've been unified with Him, we've been brought near to Him, and so now we're to live that out, to pursue peace, to walk in unity with each other. And listen, that's not always easy, is it? Because people are messy, right? Because we all still have sin in our lives, because we hurt each other sometimes. Because we don't always treat each other the way that we should. And so unity is a challenge. And so Paul wanted the, the church to realize this is a big deal. And if you're going to walk worthy, you've got to work on this area. And he's going to give them not just a how, but a why. Because how many of you say, you need to know why you do something, right? We all want to know why. Why do we do this, right? Well, here's why. Ephesians 4. He says, there's one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one Hope that belongs to your call. So he says, here's the why, right? That we've been called into one body, into one family, through one spirit, and we have one hope. And so we're to seek to live in unity with each other. And, and that doesn't mean we pretend everything's okay. That means sometimes we have to confront. Sometimes we have to work things out, right? There has to be uh, uh, conversations. There has to be sometimes forgiveness and humility and restoration. But we do that because of this concept of oneness, one body. Right? I love that picture. Listen, God has one family. And, and one of the things I love about Chehi is we really live that out. Right? Because we all come from different denominations and different backgrounds. But here's the thing. While those things are fine and it's good to, to find connection with people who are like-minded, God only has one family. And when we get into eternity, into heaven and new creation, right, we're not going to even think about our old denominations. Right? Because we're only going to be thinking about Jesus and the Father and the Spirit. Right? There's one body. There's one Spirit. Right? There's one Spirit. You know, one of the amazing things about knowing Christ is that the Holy Spirit fills you and He lives in you. And there's a connection now that you have with other believers. Right? I had the opportunity to go on a few mission trips when I was in college. And, and one of the things that I found amazing was that we could travel to another country and live with and spend a week with people in a different culture who shared a, spoke a different language and sometimes it was really hard to communicate and I really wished in those moments that I paid attention in Spanish class right so if you're taking a foreign language pay attention you might have the opportunity to use it one day but one of the things that was so amazing was there was this amazing bond, this love that we had that, that, that couldn't be explained right our cultures were different we looked different we talked different but there was a connection, and that connection was the Holy Spirit. We, we had a, a, a bond, right? We have been brought together in one spirit. And then he says, one hope. One hope. You have been called to hope. Listen, I, I, 
I want you to realize that, that all of this walking worthy and living in peace and unity with each other, all of that, he says, is because there's one body, one spirit, and one hope. This, this word hope there talks about our confident expectation, right? That God is going to do what he says, that he is the author and the finisher of our salvation. That if God has saved you, you belong to him. And no matter what trials you go through, no matter what difficulties you go through, no matter what challenges you go through, you can live with hope. Why? Because we have the hope of spending forever in the presence of our Savior. Right? Eternity with him. That's our hope. And he wanted them to know that they had been called to hope. Listen, we look at our world sometimes and we look at all the problems and the challenges and the darkness and we might feel hopeless. We might even look at our own life and our own struggles and our own problems and sometimes they seem so big and they seem so overwhelming and they are big and they can be overwhelming but God wants us to remember the hope that we have in Him and that we should live with hope. Right, and so I want to challenge you Right, you know, to live with hope that, that don't, we don't want to be people who just complain about the darkness. But we, as people who have experienced God's light, right, we've been called to take His light to that darkness. And it's so easy to get caught up in just complaining about things. But listen, the world has been a bad place for a long time, right, ever since Cain killed Abel. Are you with me? You remember that story, right? Remember when God came down to Cain? He said, Cain, I've got a question for you. I haven't seen your brother post anything on Instagram lately. Are you with me? Are you awake? Right? He says, I haven't seen, I haven't seen any of Abel's selfies with his sheep. You know, you know, I think Abel liked to take sheep selfies and, and post them on his Instagram. He was proud of his sheep. Right? Are you with me? Are you awake? All right. As far as we know, Abel did not actually have Instagram, okay? Right, but ever since Cain murdered his brother... Right, the world has been filled with evil and violence. Right, and there's coming a day when God is going to end that. But until that day, we live in expectation. We live in hope. And so I want you to believe that hope. And I want you to base your life on that. And so I have a little phrase that I used a few years ago with my youth group. But don't just believe it, behave it. Right, I know the grammar is bad, all right? But that's the point. You'll remember it. Right, don't just believe that you have that hope. Live your life as though that hope is real. Lift your eyes to Jesus. And that's what Paul does here in these next two verses. He lifts our eyes back to Jesus. He says, there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Listen, God calls us to be people of unity, unified in relationship with Him first. Right? We can't have unity with each other until we've been made right with God. But then he calls us to live in unity with others, with humility and gentleness and patience, bearing with each other in love. Why? Because we have this incredible hope, right? We've been called to one hope. And then he says, our unity is always based in truth, right? Unity is not affirming everyone. Unity is not saying everybody's correct. Unity is not affirming everybody's choices. Unity is not compromise, right? Unity is based in the truth. There's one Lord, right? Jesus is the way, the truth and the life, right? There's only one way to the Father, and that way is Jesus, right? And so our unity is in Jesus. It's not in saying that everyone goes to heaven. It's not saying that all belief systems are equal or valid. That's not unity, right? That's, that's disillusion. That's denying the truth. Jesus is the only way. There's one Lord. There's one faith, right? Faith alone in Jesus is what saves us, not our works, not our denomination, not belonging to a church, not anything other than Jesus. Right? When Jesus went to the, the night before Jesus went to the cross, he begged his Father. What did he beg him for? Father, if there's any other way that you can save the world, if there's any other way that you can accomplish your plan, then please, please what? Let this cup, this cup of judgment that I'm about to drink, let this cup pass from me. And can you imagine the Father's heart as he hears the Son pleading? for his life. Right? As a dad, I can imagine the father's heart. And see, if there had been any other way that God could make people right, if there had been any other way that God could save us and forgive us and restore us, if there was any other way that God could redeem us, he would have. But there was no other way. And so Jesus pleased with his father, yet Jesus himself says, yet not my will, 
but yours be done. There is only one way, and that way is Jesus. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. And that word there just simply means to be immersed, to be in Christ, right? And we express that through the act of baptism, and we all come from different traditions, and we we baptize differently, but the, the point is that we identify with Christ in baptism, right? And that there's only one, and that we are unified together. And then he says there's one God and one Father, Right? Everyone who knows the Son knows God as their Father. And he says this God is over all and through all and in all. And our unity is in him. Listen, Paul desired. He pleaded with the church. He says, I urge you to walk worthy. This morning, I want you to think about your walk. That, that word walk means your life. And I want you to think about your life. And I want you to think about, am I really seeking to live worthy? of the calling to which I've been called. And listen, it's not about trying harder, right? It's not about doing a bunch of things. Listen, you are worthy because Jesus has made you worthy, right? You're worthy because you have the righteousness of Christ. It's who you are. And so Paul didn't say you have to try to become worthy. He just said live it out. Live out who you are. Live a life equal to the calling that you've been called. And so I want you to think about, am I seeking to walk worthy? Am I living with humility? Right? Seeing myself as God sees me. Am I seeking to live in unity with other believers? Right? Am, am I seeking to, to be a person of peace and gentleness and meekness? Am, am I seeking unity in the truth of the gospel? Am I walking worthy? Would you bow your heads this morning? And just in a moment of, of prayer reflection and think about, God, what is it that you want to speak to me this morning? Right? I believe that God is a God who speaks and He wants to speak to you today. And I don't know exactly what He wants to say to you, but if you would listen, you'll hear Him speak. And I want you to think about, God, what is it that you want me to do based on what you've heard? Is there something in my life that needs to change? You know, one of the things that God did for me when he brought me here, was he convicted me that I was not seeking to live a life that was worthy of my calling. And I wanted to. And I repented of that. And I I began to change and let God change my behavior. It was a process. It's still a process. But if your desire this morning, if you'd say, you know what, I'm sort of convicted. I feel a conviction that I'm not really walking worthy of my calling. But I want to. I, I want to, whenever I leave in a, in a few days or weeks, I want to, to live differently. I want to walk worthy. And I want you to pray for me. Would you just raise your hand so I could pray for you and just say, that's my desire. I feel the Lord speaking that to me. Thank you so much for your courage. Father, I thank you for this amazing group of students and counselors and staff and faculty. Father, thank you for those this morning who particularly said that they wanted to make this commitment. Father, help them to do that. You love them. They're your child. Help them to honor that commitment. In Jesus' name. Amen.